the Father Francis became the guardian of the two boys. So he was a father figure for most of their lives. Um, Father Francis, now Morgan should tell you something as a surname. He was half Welsh and half Spanish. Uh, interesting descent really there. And later on in life, Tolkien described him quite affectionately as an upper-class Welsh Spaniard Tory. Uh, <laughs> I love that phrase. Um, now, through Father Francis, Tolkien's fascination with Welsh continued. This is, as I said, that's what I think has happened there, that there were Welsh books, you know, probably grammars and phonologies at uh, Francis, uh, Father Francis Library that Tolkien had a go at at you know, a very young age. Uh, and we know also that Father Francis took both boys on a railway journey to Wales at some point in childhood. Really annoyingly and kind of frustratingly, we don't know much about that trip. Where did they go? How long did they stay? Did Tolkien have a chance to hear you know, Welsh uh, speak, spoken at the time? We don't know. Now, this is my little project at the moment because later on in life, in 1966, Tolkien gave an interview uh, and he's quoted as saying, I was born with a talent for language, just as someone is born with a talent for music. As a small boy, I remember going on the train to Wales and seeing the name Ebu. Mm -hmm. Now that's a good, yes. that's good, you know, that's something. I just couldn't get over it. Not long afterwards, I started inventing my own languages and we'll come to that. So Tolkien soon uh, follows Smith in the 19th Lancashire Fusiliers. Um, again, we don't know why specifically there, probably because his friends were there. Uh, mainly also it's been speculated because he thought that he might train in Wales and he always wanted to go back there. Uh, but by that time Tolkien had already not just started inventing languages but also writing his long uh, opus that later on became the Silmarillion, his mythology, the mythology of the elves. Um, that, that's the background really of what we now know as the Lord of the Rings. And there were, he had already developed two invented languages for the elves to speak. One was Quinia, based on Finnish, and the other was Sindarin, based on Welsh. So at that time, not only is he interested in motifs or using storylines, he's using the sounds of the Welsh language in his own nomenclature. There is this conception in people's mind that Tolkien is very much about Englishness and there is a lot of... Um, and his identity was straightforwardly English. He was a professor of Anglo-Saxon. He did teach... Little flies. He did teach uh, Old English, Medieval English and Old Norse at Oxford University and at Leeds where he, he started for a few years before he returned to Oxford. So. What is going on there? You know, how, how is the, the Celtic and the, and the English element, um, how do they fit together? And a lot of people, when, when I start saying, well, there are Welsh elements in the Shire, they say, what in the Shire? That's the beacon of Englishness. How can that be? Because the Shire is always celebrated as very English, you know, the, the, the name itself, you know, kind of representing the quintessential English county. And the hobbits are, are uh, usually described as very English, very rural of the turn of the century. Uh, Tolkien actually said once that the Shire, um, for him, was something like more or less a Warwickshire village of about the period of the Diamond Jubilee. That's the Diamond Jubilee of Victoria, Queen Victoria. Uh, and its Englishness re relies on place names and proper names, and obviously the material culture of the, of the um, rural village of the turn of the century. However, if one looks at the map of the Shire, and if one's follow Frodo, Sam, Mary and Pippin on the journey away from the Shire and towards Bree, one will start noticing place names and family names of Welsh origin. Right. So what happens there, you have in the middle, you have all of the English place names. On the edge, on the right actually, on the east rather than on the west, weirdly, you start having Welsh names like Buckland, Crick Howell, the Yale, the Brandy Bridge, etc. Now, later on, Tolkien wrote, and that's actually from an unpublished manuscript that was published uh, years and years after he died, Buckland in the Shire in many ways occupied a position with regard to the Shire such as Wales does to England and it is not wholly inappropriate therefore to represent its many very peculiar names by names of a Celtic or especially Welsh character. Now he says to represent. Now Tolkien had a very complicated theory when it came to writing The Lord of the Rings, well The Hobbit first and then The Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit was published in 1937, The Lord of the Rings took another <coughs> nearly 20 years to write, published in uh, 54 and 55. The, the, the conceit, the, 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 um, the theory that Tolkien has at the beginning is that, you know what people, I haven't really written any of that. What happened is that I found a very old manuscript 
and I've translated it and that's part of it is the Hobbit and part of it is the Lord of the Rings. Now that that's a very old technique. You know, this is a technique that goes back a long time. For an author to say, I haven't written that, I found an old book and I transcribed it, or I found an old book and I translated it. So that's that's the conceit. He's kind of telling us the book I found and I'm translating came from Middle Earth itself. So he's in a way validating his own world. Now what he's saying is I'm translating in English but because the Shire had some weird place names on the side that weren't quite the same as most of the Shire, I have to translate those as Welsh because of the same relationship between England and Wales. England in the middle, Wales on the side. That's exactly what he's trying to replicate. There. Am I making sense? Yes, I know it's complicated, but there we are. Okay, so according to the, the history of the Hobbits, the Hobbits are um, divided into three main tribes. You have the, the Harfoots, the Stoors and the Fallohites. And that's the three main families of the Hobbits that first came to the Shire uh, at the beginning uh, of the colonies. Now, the Hobbits of Buckland in the Shire are Stoors. And the Stoors came to the Shire later. And actually, according to Tolkien's theory, they had picked up linguistic elements from different kinds of people. So if the common speech, the speech of all the Hobbits, is translated as English, it follows that the linguistic elements and place names of Buckland are Celtic and Welsh specifically. And if I can find... There we are. Those are my, my old trusty copies. So he's, this is the, the Return of the King. And how, many, how many people have read the, um, the appendices? Not everybody gets through those, I'm afraid, oh, but um, great time. for those of you that have. He's saying in the appendices, that's a pe the, the famous appendix F, where he talks about the languages. Pretty hard thing, uh, things to read at the beginning. But he says, the names of the Bucklanders were different from those of the rest of the Shire. The folk of the Marish and their offshoots across the Brandywine were in many ways peculiar. It was from the former language of the Southern Stores, no doubt, that they inherited many of their names. These I have usually left unaltered, for if queer now, they were queerer in their own day. They had a style that we should perhaps feel vaguely to be Celtic. Since the survival of traces of the older language of the Stuarts and the Bree men resembled the survivors of Celtic, sorry, the survival of Celtic elements in England, I have sometimes imitated the later in my translation. Buckland we talked about. The other place name in that map that I have is the Yale, and the Yale is uh, derived from an obsolete Welsh, an old Welsh term for hill country, uh, Idl, I-D-L. Now, as you leave from the Shire, go through Buckland, then you continue and you find yourself in Bree. And in Bree is where, if you remember, the hobbits were attacked by the Black Riders, and it's quite dramatic scenes in the film adaptations. Now, Bree itself is a name derived from Welsh, Bray's Hill. Uh, and actually, if you see around in, in, in the other map that's circulating of Bree, there is Bree, and next to it is Bree Hill, which is a tautology, because Bree means hill already, so it's a hill hill, really. And next to it, it's Chetwood. And Chetwood, again, the element Chet comes from C Ked, C-E-D, that's the old Celtic root. In Welsh today, it has become Coid, which again is wood. So Chetwood really means wood, wood. It's a tautology, half Welsh, half English. The other, the other place name there is Archet, and again you have by the wood. R is something that we use today. The Welsh name for that today would have been Argoid, Archet, exactly uh, the same derivation. And Coom uh, by Brie, again Welsh Coom, C W M, is a valley. And there is an old English word uh, called Coom that means valley, but Tolkien believed that the old, the, the, the Anglo-Saxons took the name from the Welsh. So this, uh, this was his, um, his explication. So, all of these place names at the edge of the Shire, just like uh, Wales appears on the side of England, are Welsh place names coming, some of them from older Celtic roots or uh, using modern Welsh equivalents as well. 